them, which is Okay, thank you very much, Zoltan, for giving a build a cell seminar and get started. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And welcome, everyone. My name is Zoltan Tisa, and I'm a uh, postdoc who works at the uh, Imperial College at the Center for Synthetic Biology. And today I want to talk about work that is related to to close close to my uh, close to my uh, interest, which includes model building, parameter estimation, mathematical optimization, and then uh, this whole uh, project is actually what I'm working on as part of the so-called Cozy Bio Consortium, and that one was supported by the European Union's Horizon 2020 framework. And then just to give you an introduction uh, about Imperial, Co Imperial College. Maybe you haven't visited London and haven't been there. So we are we are located in, in London, in central London. We have multiple campuses there. And because of the lack of space, there are some you know, interesting architectural choices we have to uh, use to accommodate everyone there. But, by the, but besides that, we have a very nice campus. And this is actually the, the building I used to work. And I, my office was behind this pink uh, panel. And now I'm working from home as many of us, but we have nice labs and those labs are actually above ground. So you have a nice view outside where you're working and waiting for your PCR to finish. Uh, and we also located in, uh, that's center of synthetic biology located in South Kensington, which is very nice. It's a museum around. About uh, teaching and researching, we have undergraduate and graduate programs in synthetic biology. So if you're interested in, check out the website and you can look into what kinds of pro programs are available. What is interesting is that those programs and those programs focusing on not just on the molecular biology aspect of, aspect of this whole uh, for whole synthetic biology, but also the engineering aspects. So you can expect uh, aspects. Sorry, you can find computational projects that are you know involved with synthetic biology. Actually, quite a few of them. So what about the title for today? Uh, there was a talk from from Jake. Bill, yeah, uh, last week well, was titled From Art to Engineering in Synthetic Biology. And I highly recommend that to, to go and watch it. It's a, it's a very, it's a great talk. There are lots of interesting ideas in it. And I thought I would just pick up the torch and take it from engineering to model building. Uh, and then I was just wanted to highlight a couple of takeaways from that talk. And then I encourage everyone to go back and watch the talk later on. But what, what, really, what really resonated with me is like three ideas is that you know, we need some kind of knowledge fusion where we have this high context language in the in the lab. We say like, Arabi knows what is Arabi knows, what is M9 media, and then it's described in a very, very good low context way, and then that will that will help you to you know move around the information and 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 identify uh, you know what is you know ten times on is ten times on yellow yellow is a lot or not. That's something like uh, good questions or or something like that we need to answer. And then, uh, well, he also highlighted this, uh, this very interesting thing that, you know, we need to control uncertainty just enough to make a reasonable chances of, have to have a reasonable chances of success. I also like this thing. So we don't need to take out all the uncertainty from the measurements and everything. We just need to have a good control over things. And the third one, which is very much connected to, to model building is standardization, so standard standard fluorescence, standard OD units. So he highlighted lots of methods. How can you attach you know, units to your measurements, not just absolute un uh, arbitrary units, right? but actually you know, cell counts and, and molecular concentrations, molar weights and things like that to your, to your uh, measurements. That is very useful for um, a model building. And then probably you're familiar with this uh, four-step process well, as summarizing what we need to do in, in synthetic biology, right? We, the four tasks, subtasks, what people usually uh, name in this process is the you know, designing of, of circuits, designing on, of functions, and then you want to build those things. So you have the combinatorial assemblies just to get different libraries assembled together. You test those given on giving your, your machines in the lab. And essentially you wanna learn from this. And I want to focus on the learning part in this talk, where I want to focus on uh, learning learning models or what models can help you to learn about your system, and how can you interpret those results, which after uh, after that feeds back to the design process, and you can really uh, redesign your system to 
to you know in, incorporate this information what you have learned in the learning process. Um, I took this uh, chart or sorry this uh, uh, block diagram from an engineering book, which walks you through you know what is what is a parameter session, what is a model building about. So I just want to go through this uh, real quick to to understand what, what what's going on, what I mean by this whole process what I'm trying to present today. So essentially, when I say process, I'm referring to something like a biological process. So you can think about gene expression, you can think about some kind of gene circuit or higher level signal pathways or things like that. And what we're trying to do is essentially building a digital twin, a model, which essentially receives the same input as the original system. And then we measure what is the output of the digital twin and what is the output of the original model, or sorry, the original system, right? So what the biological system. And essentially you wanna measure the gap between the two. And to do so, essentially what you need to do is that you have to evaluate that gap in some metric. So that's what's called the cost evaluation. But here when it comes to the, the question of units, right? So when you have a biological process that you measure through a machine that spits out arbitrary units and you wanna close the gap, then, then you don't have, is it, is it 5,000 molar or 5,000 nanomolar? molar? What is, what is what, how large is the gap? So you have to have units here to essentially effectively evaluate the gap between your original model, sorry, original process and the digital twin, right? And then there is a fourth component in this whole picture, which I'm not gonna talk about too much, is this called optimization, the mathematical optimization, which presents guesses in form of parameters or, or model structure to your, to your whole, whole uh, model building or parameterization process, where you could try out different parameterization, different ideas, essentially with your model to, to close the gap, gap between your biological process and model. And uh, this is essentially the whole process, what, it, um, what I try to talk about today, you know, not focusing on all the parts, but some of, some of it. And then there is a question what I was asked a couple of months ago, which struck me really, um, really hard because, you know, I never reevaluated this question. It's just, why, why, do you, why do you do PCRs or things like that? So why do we need models? That was the question. And I was trying to think hard that why do we need models? to answer certain questions. And then I came up with this or found this story, which goes like this. There are many versions of the story is that there is a city of blind people. And then uh, one day the king visits the city. And then in this uh, city, uh, the king brings an elephant with him. And uh, you know the people gather around the elephant and then they're trying to you know use their senses except seeing it to try to make sense what they, what they have in front of them. So what they say, it's a rope, it's a wall, it's a tree, it's a snake, it's a fan, right? So based on their limited experience with this big object, they're trying to, to draw a conclusion what they have in front of them. And then basically they say, okay, this, you know, it represents something that they're familiar with. And then they say, this is what they see. But in fact, uh, they have one elephant. So there's one big elephant and you just observe the different parts of that elephant. And I think this is a very good analogy for, for nonlinear systems. And nonlinear systems include um, biological processes, what we are working with, right? So it could be very much that, you know, we're observing some part of the, of the process. And then we say, okay, it's a rope. Like, and then if you say change some experimental conditions, it could be that it teleports you, you know, other parts of the elephant and you see something vastly different and you think it's something different. It's, it's a completely different system. But in fact, this is just part of the same elephant. Just to give you an idea, I, I wanted to highlight this, this paper by uh, Tyson et al. It's not the latest paper, it's 2003, but I think it's a really good paper. What they did is that they looked through a couple of signaling pathways and then, um, they show that what kind of behavior you can expect from these very simple models. So for example, they have here, uh, let's say a gene expression network where, where signal, signal, signaling pathway where you have some signal which affects some parts of the network and then you measure some response, right? So for example, 
here you you have um, an increasing signal, right? You're increasing the stop signal, and then you measure the response. And what is interesting about the response is that essentially over time it returns to the baseline level. That's what we usually call adaptation. So it adapts to the input, right? And then there are more exact exotic behavior uh, than this. For example, we can we can look into this so-called mutual mutual activation where you have a signal and a response. And then essentially where you defending where you start the system in very your initial conditions closer to this black dot or this black dot, you see very different response. So in the signal response curve, you can you can end up here or you can end up here, just you know, depending where you or you start your system, right? You, you're experiencing very different parts of the elephant. In fact, the same elephant, just depending on where you start your system. I don't want to go into very much details, you know, what bifurcation diagrams means, but I want to highlight, you know, that, um, that these systems can exhibit very different uh, behavior. So, so the third example is even, even uh, more exotic than you can have, depending on where you start, you can have multiple equilibria and you can get to that you know different parts of the elephant and then uh, you try to make sense what's going on but in the same time at the time is the you know at the same time this is just exactly the same you know signaling pathway and you're observing different uh, behavior of the system if there is any question i'm happy to answer those but if not then i wanted to give you some more examples so for example it's a more biological example there is a Georgie et al. from 2015, I guess, where they did a very nice experiment. Essentially what they had is that they had two independent genes. Uh, one of them is expressing RFP, the other one is expressing GFP. And then what they, what they observed is that, uh, you know, they're completely independent from each other, but essentially if they, if they push up the, the RFP level into this high, with uh, different copy numbers and RF, um, RBS sites, then they observe a lower expression for uh, GFP. And then if they decrease the, the uh, RFP expression of the RFP uh, signal, right? So what produces the RFP signal, then they can observe higher GFP. And then essentially they put a very nice model behind it where they observe is that essentially and there are so-called Isocos lines. These lines were, this line presents an inescapable, inescapable uh, constraint on your system. Essentially, you can move it up and down and you can tilt it different directions, but essentially there is a limit how much you can push you know, your system. What is the attainable level of expression of GFP and, and RFP? And this model, what they put behind it, I didn't uh, copy all the model, essentially capture this, this behavior and nicely explain that what's going on and how can you design circuits here or there. I really like this paper. I think it's a very nice connection with uh, experimental work and mathematical modeling. Another example, this is more a uh, textbook example, uh, is a so-called lotka volterra model. So for example, in this model, uh, we are tracking the the number of uh, number of animals in two species, let's say uh, rabbits and and foxes, and then over time, you know the rabbits are produced, and, you know rabbits are multiplying, and there are more rabbits, and then with some rate, uh, foxes are eating the rabbits and creating new foxes, and the foxes are getting old and and and, and dying out. What is interesting is this thing that if I fix the parameters alpha, beta, delta, and and gamma, and I do uh, and I start the system from different initial conditions, right? So I have 30 foxes and, sorry, 30 rabbits and 10 foxes. What is happening is that the rabbit, number of rabbits, you know, decreasing over time. And then the number of foxes are increasing because, you know, they, they have lots of food. And at some point the whole foxes population collapses to let's say one fox. And then the rabbits get, you know, more and more rabbits we get in, in, in this, in this, into this, uh, ecological model. And then at some point it starts to oscillate, right? The oscillation of the rabbits and foxes population. And if you start from, from different initial conditions of the system, essentially you observe the same, for the same parameters for the same oscillation, right? So this is something that, you know, this model gives you or captures that, you know, depending or independent of where you start, you will observe the same 
behavior. I believe there is a question. Uh, I think you have a couple questions. Sure, let's address them. Uh, if I can, you read those because if I quit, then this presentation stops. Yep. Um, first question from Peter: If the elephant is the whole proper model, would it still be useful to make detailed model of one subsystem, for example, suction through the trunk? This obviously applies to models of whole cells versus uh, cell subsystems. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's yeah. If you if you if you guarantee that you know you're never going to uh, experience the other part of the elephant, then it it bursts to right. You can say that you know because it's a very interesting interview. So because I'm working with uh, cell-free systems, right, and I don't have any if I have different concentration regime, right. So let's say that the concentration regime cuts the elephant into half, right. And then your cell-free system lives here. You're never going to experience the other side, like the higher concentration uh, in vivo, uh, in vivo environment, right? So then you, your cell lives here, and then you experience that. But um, the the analogy is more works like you know what you have one system, right? You have an E. coli, right? And you put your genes in the E. coli, and then it's expressing that, and and then the behavior of that circuit is changing depending on what you do. If you put the plasmid concentration um, by changing the, uh, the copy numbers or you have different RBS sites, you might experience some different behavior, right? So it's, it's more about the same environment, changing some parameters in that environment, you know, you, you creating a knockout, right? And then that changes the whole behavior of the system. Thank you. And a second question from Barnaby. For synthetic cell engineering, can you build a model that predicts the exact behavior of all molecules in a simplest cell? Or is the common opinion in the field more that you won't be able to model because even simplest synthetic cell that's alive will be too complex to model? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, essentially what, uh, I don't have that slide. I wanted to put it probably that would answer this question very well. So the modeling is a choice, right? So you have a choice what level of details you want to capture, right? So for example, in this ecology model right here, I captured the, the number of rabbits and, and foxes and sure they, how they interact, right? The, the process of, of, of you know, getting more rabbits is, is we know from biology is not that it's like this or you know, hunting is, is, is not like this. So this is, this is a very simple model where it essentially just uh, captures that the the fact that rabbits are you know we have more rabbits and then you know they they eat, eat carrots but we don't capture those right they just over time we get more rabbits and then over time you know the rabbits are decreasing because of the number of foxes and and the, the decrease how, how many rabbits we get out of the system is actually proportional to the foxes so this is a choice what we made in this model and other models to capture one of some aspects of a system Right, so when you mentioned the synthetic cells and real cells, there you have also a choice what you want to capture. You, if you want to capture all the molecules and their movement, probably you're out of luck because it creates a very detailed model that you cannot really simulate. Think about, for example, they want to build uh, very detailed models of, of uh, mouse brain, right? As a computer simulation, and they still cannot do it when they have all the neurons and they have more simplified model to, to capture the essence of of the neurological pathways. The same applies here that, you know, you, you choose which model, which modeling level you want, which obstruction level you want. I don't know if you answered your question. Do we have more questions, Kate? Thank you, that's it for now. There are no more questions. Great. Okay, so, so where was I? So I was talking about these rabbits and, and foxes. And essentially what I did is that I was changing the initial condition of the system, right? So, and then, uh, what has happened is that regardless of the initial condition, we ended up with the same oscillation, right? So if I wanted to uh, present over time, the whole thing, right? So if I want the, the rabbits with this color, so they oscillating like this, and if I want to represent the uh, foxes, then they essentially out of sync, they going up uh, with, the, with the rabbits, right? So, and that would present in the, um, that was present this oscillation 
in the population of rabbits and foxes. And by the way, this is not a, a not a just purely ecological model. If you if you're working with co-cultures, uh, so you have two species, right? If you have like two kinds of uh, E. coli, or you have E. coli and um, and uh, and yeast, or just yeast yeast, then you can observe this behavior if they are like you know attacking each other, attacking each other, or collaborating in each other. And different uh, aspects are actually very much captured by ecological models, what you would experience in co-cultures. So it's this is not that far from our um, from our interest. And three more questions, or one more question. Uh, the question is: Can you use lot Cavalterra model for competing biochemical networks? Uh, yes, if you if you name these uh, if you name these um, rabbits and foxes to your competing uh, chemicals. Yes, the, the abstraction is there, so you can do that. I will ref I will reference a very good tutorial where you can learn how to do this kind of biochemical uh, modeling. And that's I all questions for now. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so that was the second one. And so the third one is, is much more interesting. So this is the, the so-called Lorenz attractor. And again, it's a very simple model. You have three states. And then this was this model was developed by uh, Edward Lorenz. I think, I believe in the 40s, 1940s, where he wanted to capture so-called atmospheric convection. So uh, sort of like a metro, um, metrology uh, the model to capture how uh, different layers of uh, the atmosphere is interacting and then essentially it came up with this three state model and then we can we can simulate this model solve this model and simulate it and then what we can get is different behavior i'm going to walk you through uh, so instead of the previous one so if you, if you remember in the previous one i was changing the initial conditions the number of rabbits and foxes this system starts with in this example, I'm going to change a parameter here, this one row. And then what's going to happen is that I have, I'm going to start here, right? So I have a little row 13 and the, the two other parameters here, sigma and beta, beta is fixed, right? And what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm solving the system. So there's the numbers, the initial conditions, by the way, is the same, so one, one, one. So I first start from a one, one, one position. And then uh, as time goes by, it's just swirls around. And then if I change from 13 to 14, then it's the, roughly the same idea. So I'm going to the positive Orton in, in terms of like 10, sorry, uh, uh, the X between zero and 10. And then I'm just running around in this uh, area, right? If I decrease, sorry, if I increase the row one more time, something interesting happens. I start here and then takes one loop and then jumps to the other round, right? So from some, something that was completely on the positive order now jumps to the negative one and does the same just with negative numbers. So just by changing a little bit, the whole setup, essentially the behavior of the system jumps around a bit. And interestingly, if I cross a threshold around 21, I get something completely out of whack. I started at the one, 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 and then Essentially, it does both sides of this of the of the swirling, and and then, as I said, uh, I'm using this term cultically. It jumps around. This is actually a so-called cultic behavior. So it, it does a couple of loops here, and then at some point it decides to jump on the other side and does a couple of loops here and back and forth, and it goes on forever. So this is a so-called chaotic behavior, and essentially, you can see here, like in in just the mild cases, you know, just changing some parameters, like you know, touching other part of the elephant. Uh, can can give you completely different sense, right? From a from a wall to a spear, you can jump around, and then not to mention this one, which is very weird. Uh, by the way, this is a often they they cite regarding with regard this model uh, something called the butterfly butterfly effect. So the butterfly effect uh, tells you is roughly summarizing is that. And you know there is a butterfly in the U.S. and flaps its wing, and there is a typhoon in Tokyo because it's so small events in the world adds up and leads to big events. So something that this model captures, right? I change one parameter a bit. It's not an order of magnitude change, right? Just change a bit, and from a nice behavior, I get this chaotic behavior. So that's why they like to associate this with this uh, butterfly effect. Okay, so that was our like three models. Uh, and um, 
well, and then and say I wanted to highlight that these are actually not, um, you know, completely abstract things, but this thing we can observe in real life. So for example, I wanted to give you two more examples just to highlight it. So for example, here's the, the rates of homelessness in, the, in, in, in US cities ranked by the level of homelessness. And now what you would think is that, you know, if, what if I remove all the homeless people from, from the streets and I give them shelter and then give them jobs and, and healthcare and all these things. And, on the, and you would say, oh, we solved homelessness, right? We don't have homeless people anymore. But what would happen is that over time, actually this distribution might come back, right? So more people actually getting back to the street, unfortunately. And then, you know, the system actually gets back to the same equilibrium, regardless is that you moved out of equilibrium and tries to go back to equilibrium. So you have to change the whole system uh, to actually uh, change the, the distribution, what you get in terms of homelessness later on. So what I, this is what I call like inherent system properties. And then the, all the examples I showed so far, those are inherent system properties, right? Or here is another one. Uh, this is from a COVID report from March from Imperial College. What they, what they try to predict is that, you know, what is going to be the weekly ICU uh, intensive care unit demand in, uh, I, I believe in Britain. Uh, over time, and then how it can be mitigated by lockdown. So what you have is that you have uh, once in one type of lockdown, this blue curve, and then once you have the lockdown later on, then the number of uh, cases that demands ICU beds is, is dropping, and then you can release the lockdown for a couple of weeks, and then you increase again, and then that's what you repeat. Actually, this is what we experience in Europe right now. Uh, so we're not far away from the prediction what they did. What's interesting is that you know without lockdown, essentially the the demand would soar, and then the natural uh, state of the system where it wants to go is much 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 higher. And of course, eventually that one goes down because you have uh, lots of immune people. But essentially, uh, this is what we refer to flatten the curve is that you have this kind of lockdowns to you know spread out the number of cases and change the system, essentially change the pandemic to a more tolerable scenario. If you wanna learn about this, but you're not necessarily you know, inclined into equations and such, I really recommend to, to read this, uh, this book, Thinking in Systems. As far as I know, there are no equations in this book, but it captures all these ideas I presented with beautiful examples and tries to you know, make you aware how this nonlinear uh, behavior manifests itself in everyday life and maybe in your experiment. And then, you know, you can later on, you can ask a model or, hey, I have this problem. How can I, how can I capture this with a, with a nice model? And if you wanna learn more, then there are resources. So one I can highlight is this book by Domotila Del Vecchio and Richard Murray. Uh, it's freely available here. You can Google biomolecular feedback systems. And there are lots of nice uh, models and actually the whole process, how we get from you know, very detailed molecular level, what was actually a question before, very detailed molecular levels to, to higher level models of uh, gene expression and, and interactions and things like that. I believe there is a question. Uh, yes, the question is, what's the best model type to figure out what circuits are necessary for a complete synthetic cell based on cell free TXTL? That's a good question. I mean, so far what we usually have is uh, is this type of models here, so-called ordinary differential equation models that ignores the spatial aspect of the of the problem. So you have just let's say in time, right? So for example, in the case of uh, foxes and and rabbits here, uh, the, this this axis is time, right? So as time goes by, you track the 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 changes of species number, but you can also think about it as time goes by, you can track the number of molecules in your system, right? This is a, a kinetic exercise, what you do in your in plate readers or microfluidic devices, right? And to capture this kind of behavior, we usually use uh, ordinary, ordinary differential equations, especially initial value uh, problems. And I believe there's another question. Uh, yeah, another question is if you have, if you had all KD values and concentrations for synthetic metabolism, do you think you could model it exhaustively or would it be too complex to track all molecules? Well, I mean, uh, too complex to track all molecules. 
it's it's an experimental question. So I like I would refer back like, is it too complex to track all the molecules for you? And probably you would say yes. But if you can track all molecules and you get all the um, constants that you mentioned, and there are other caveats, but essentially then you can build a good model. Uh, but but essentially getting those numbers, those uh, the numbers right in a model that is, that's, that's again a whole whole other presentation. I can talk about it. But essentially, yes, there, there are ways and people doing that. And I think that was the last question so far, right? Okay, so so I highlighted the book, uh, so you can download this book and and solve the problems and 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 the exercises in it. I think it's a very good book. I think it's six seven years old, but still uh, walks you through the process of what I think many people mentioned uh, in what I did, can distill from the questions. And I can see like it's popping up, so there is a one more question. Oh, <laughs> it's but more I cannot of a, read it. It's more of a comment from Anders. He says, uh, so it's all our fault. The experimentalists are, are not providing enough data. <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, I don't want to go into this thing. I don't think it's, um, I think the the equipment that creates the, the data is just low frequency, right? If you can do like 5,000 experiments per day, uh, which is humanly not possible, then you can get more data and you can get what I mentioned is uh, 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 built uh, design, design build test learn cycle. Like you can increase the frequency of that thing, right? And also the, uh, the breadth of that. Yeah, so I think, I think it's not, not, not a data question. It's more like a frequency of data, how much data we can get and how fast we can get. Okay, so just to, to go back to this one. So the second one I really, really recommend is uh, Justin Boyce webpage. He teaches lots of courses at Caltech and essentially besides, it, it, besides uh, the lecture notes, you can see Python notebooks or essentially Jupyter notebooks where you can actually grab the code and execute it on your computer or even in your browser if you have uh, Google Colab. And then you can see how these you know, models evolve over time and you can tweak numbers. So it's a fantastic, fantastic resource to, to, um, to you know, dip your toes in and get into this kind of modeling. And also we just finished recently the build a cell chemical reaction modeling tutorial, which was, I believe a seven or six week long uh, tutorial. We all recorded all the, all the lectures and it's available on the build a cell. YouTube channel, so you can go there and watch these. And also we have a Slack channel, so you can, on the Slack channel, you can uh, uh, ask questions if you have later on uh, follow-up questions with this. Uh, and I believe there's another question. Uh, yeah, the question is, what's the most complex kinetic model ever made? I mean, what Ooh. size of system? One gene pathway or whole organelle, et cetera? Who? That is interesting. So I, I know a group in Germany and they working with kinetic models on the order of thousands of states. So thousands of uh, state variables. So if you go back to here, so I have three here, they have like two thousands or five thousands. That's quite big in my opinion. And, and they, they, try to, um, they try to make sense of their model and, and find parameters for that model. So size uh, is one question, what, kind, what, what size of model you have, but it's that in this case for them is a is a modeling choice. They have information for each individual stage, in the, sorry each individual state, and so they can afford this kind of five thousand models. But if you if you would say like I would I would measure like GFP for one gene, you cannot have like a five five thousand state model. You don't have enough data. So it's a it's a balance between the type of an amount of data you have and and uh, what kind of model you can build from that. Okay, so I, I mentioned these three resources, I highly recommend them. So you can, you can uh, go and check them out if you want to. But I think this, this book is really, really good resource to, to learn about, you know, just the thinking, right? This kind of thinking, like if I, if I don't change the system, but you know, I remove something from it, over time you will get back, unfortunately, homelessness people, homeless, you get back the same homelessness rate, right? Or in case of COVID, there are like 
built-in be, uh, behavior of the system. And this is governed by equations, but you can learn about that here. But if you want more, there are more resources. Okay, and then many people would say, and then this question uh, did not come up so far, like, what about machine learning? I would just do machine learning, right? I, I, one would, I don't need these models. I would just, you know, punch the, the numbers into a big machine and then it spits out uh, these neural network models. But I'm, my answer is that that's great. But in order to do that, you need to climb this uh, pyramid. And before I climb the pyramid, I think there's one more question. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Will the build a cell modeling tutorial run again live? Uh, it was not planned, but it can come back by popular demand. We just need to reach out to Kate. <laughs> <laughs> or reach out and, to William, who was really in charge yeah, of it. Yeah, but I think I think we captured the essence in uh, in the video series. So I would watch the video series first. And there is a build a cell Slack channel where you can join. And then you can, uh, so there's a build a cell Slack workspace. And within that, we have a modeling tutorial uh, channel where you can actually ask questions and you can send your, let's say your Python notebook and say like, hey, what, what is going on? It doesn't work and why is that? And, and we help lots of people by this in the past. So I think it's, it's good. And there's one more question. Oh, that's just thanks follow up from David who asked the sure. previous question. Okay. Yeah, so just, so, just for everyone, there is a uh, build a cell YouTube channel where all of those modeling tutorials that Zoltan is talking about are recorded and available for everyone. So you can find it and you can go through the whole tutorial. Yep. I think it, this this is from the website. So actually I, I captured from the website. So if you go to, I'm not sure, like seminar series or workshop, one of these links, uh, probably this one, and then you can find this this whole web page. Uh, so this this is actually uh, takes you to the YouTube channel, and you can watch it. Uh, so coming back to here, so you would say, okay, uh, I have a, I have my dream. Okay, I, I don't want to do all these models. I just want to do you know neural networks, deep learning, and all these you know very uh, hyped techniques. And I would say, that, yeah, you can do that. But essentially you have to climb this pyramid first. And uh, this, this uh, pyramid was suggested by Monica Rogatti, uh, I think in 2015 or around that. There is a whole article you can read about this. But essentially what, what needs to be done is that you have, to, you have to have in place good collection, right? You collect your data. I believe in, in labs, that one is, is taken care of, right? You, you, you have instrumentation and you, you log in information and you, you get that content. But in the next level, you know, you have to move that data between, let's say between computational and lab people. And then that data needs to be cleaned and, and, and prepared. And, you know, you have also anomalies. So it's some kind of uh, numbers that doesn't make sense. And then if you wanna do like supervised learning then you have to label them, what is a good data, what is a bad data. And on top of that, you have to do some kind of like this AB testing is, is an industrial term for you know, when you have wild type of the same system, right? So you have the, the uh, wild type and then you do a genetic knockout, that would be uh, something like that constitutes an A-B test in, in data science terms, right? And then, you know, you have to have all of your algorithms what you're already using in place. And then once you have that, you, you climbed up to the top of this pyramid and then you can start doing uh, deep learning or, or very advanced machine learning. Uh, and until then, I, I think it's hopeless. So I, you won't get reliable data, reliable results out of it. And uh, your, your results won't you know, stand the test of time. So think about this, uh, uh, until, this until such time arrives, we can just you know, plug in all our data into this thing. Um, I would like to offer a different approach. So what I'm working on is a, a closed loop automated model identification uh, what I mean by that, I'm going to explain. Essentially, what we have here is that we have some kind of uh, device that that does, uh, you know, track cells on a microscope, and then gets into a computer, and the computer does some magic. I will talk about that. What is that? And then, based on that, it creates comments like inducers to the system, and then uh, that inducers get into, let's say, a microfluidic device, 
and then you observe that microfluidic device and see what's the response. And then the computer, based on that response, calculates next, next set of inputs to the system. And then you have this whole loop where you can essentially uh, do multiple, go around multiple ties, times and uh, try to find essentially models. So what, the, what happens in a the, in the computer is essentially this process, what we call uh, automated model identification. So building type of models, you, you have seen the first part of the, of the presentation. So the, the first step what we have is that we have experimental data, what we collect from, let's think about like plate reader data when you have kinetics, right? Over time, you record that. We have some data processing and I'm gonna talk about what is this dictionary building and there's an algorithm, but essentially at the end of the algorithm gives you those models I, I presented or similar models I presented in the first part of the talk, like the Lotko Volterra, the Lorenz attractor um, and such that you, that equations or models is written automatically by the, by the process. And then it, fe it feds back to, to a, a, um, a process called model discrimination, optimal, exper optimal experimental design. I'm not gonna talk about this, but essentially that is the part when you try to make sense, what is the best next experiment, right? So when you have, sorry, uh, when you have this, uh, you know, when you want to have, okay, what is the next, you know, syringe movement, what I need for my system, I have to calculate that on the computer. And essentially it happens here based on the model, what we are doing. So yeah, I actually just walked you through this. So I recollect experimental data, we run an algorithm and um, that creates OD models. And then we feedback this. So what, I, what, I, what do I mean by, by creating ODE models? So the term what we use is composing ordinary differential equations. It's a bit similar to musical uh, composing, right? When you have, a, uh, you wanna compose some music, you have musical notes and you can move them up and down and then change other properties, uh, the rhythm of that music and things like that. And essentially what you have is, is a music sheet uh, capturing the tune and the rhythm of that music. And what we're trying to do is that capture, let's say the behavior of foxes and rabbits or other molecular process, if you wish, in a form of differential equations, right? So then the question, what you have, what kind of parameters, kinetic parameters should I put here? And actually also the number of terms, what you have here is also a question. What kind of right-hand side terms I need to put here? And uh, just give you an, an idea, for example, here is a, uh, um, experimental data. So for example, there are two systems here, network one and network two, and then we have one, two, three, four states, and then two inputs not shown here. And then this is the input to the system, one, one part of, the, one part of the, the ingredients for the algorithms. And then the other uh, part of the, uh, another example would be like five, sta five states and one input, but I'm gonna talk about this one. So this is the experimental data, what we collect. And, um, the next part, what is important, what stands between the data, what we collected and the equations, what we want to write is a so-called dictionary of nonlinear functions. So this is a collection of nonlinear functions that uh, representing some kind of interaction inside the system and it's assembled by a domain expert. So what is this magic dictionary is about? So for example, if you think about it, what is possible in a, in a kinetic model, so you can have like, usually mass action kinetics, right? So when you, the speed of the reaction is, uh, is proportional by uh, the concentration of the species, or you have more uh, uh, other terms like Hill activation, Hill repression. You can essentially make terms like this into so-called dictionary. So that could be like hundreds of terms. And then you run the algorithm and that algorithm tries to figure out essentially how to, how to compose this right-hand side of the equation, right? Just like the music, how to compose, shall I select this one? Do I need this to capture this? Or, or do I need this one? And then if I, if I select this one, what is the con kinetic constant in front of here? Do I, do I need five? Do I need 10 here? And the algorithm tries to figure out these uh, answers uh, based on the input data, what we have, and based on the dictionaries, what we put together, capturing you know, what is possible in a molecular interaction. And then uh, what we get out of it is this set of equations and also the corresponding parameters. And what you can see here is that in blue, we have the original data and in orange, we generated a model. We wrote this model by the algorithm. So the, uh, let's say the algorithm wrote that uh, the model 
and that tries to capture uh, the features of this blue curve by the orange curve. So the orange curve, how we get the orange curve. So uh, the blue curve is the data. The orange curve is that we have this model and we solve this ODE model. And then the solution of this ODE model is the orange curve here. And the parameters for that model is, is given here. So this is what I mean that writing the model automatically from data, this is the model what we write from the blue data. So just to recap and, and summarize, so what we're trying to do this pro from this process is that we collect some data, we do some data processing, we build, build this dictionary capturing the, the, the what is essentially in, in a domain, right? If you're in electrical engineering, you would have a different dictionary. If you, if you are in, in molecular biology, you have another uh, dictionary. So you put together that, you run the algorithm, what we call sparse Bayesian learning, but essentially uh, what it does is that at the end, we can get ODE models out of it. And from this ODE model in the computer, we can do an optimal experimental design that comes up with the numbers, you know, how much should I, should I push the syringe in this molecular, sorry, in this microfluidic chamber. And we observe the results, we process that and put it into the computer here. And we try to go through this process as many times as possible essentially settle down in what with one set of equations representing a model capturing the elephant essentially and uh, just to uh, finish up so we have this software which does it's called od composer it's uh, it's in python pip installable so you can go on github and, and and have a look how we developed it and you can also try out and i would appreciate if someone wants to try out and wants to be a beta uh, beta tester for this uh, uh, software and I would like to acknowledge uh, my PI, uh, Ibar Stan Imperial College, and also my collaborators and University of Edinburgh, Filippo, Lucia, David, David, and Varun. And also uh, my external collaborators at the Cozy Bio Project and uh, the founder of uh, the uh, European Union. And I also would like to thank you for, uh, for your attention. Okay, that's it. Questions? Thanks. Thank you very much, Sultan. Um, I don't see any new questions right now. I think you were answering them as they came. That's great. Yeah, I think, and then we also finished on time, I believe. So that's good. Anyhow, if you if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. If you want to learn about these kind of modelings, I offered some resources. I think we can put those resources into the YouTube video description. Um, I can send you an email and you just copy it to the description on the video. Uh, and I think there's a question or just thank you. It's just thanks for a great talk. <laughs> and another one. Thank you, Zoltan. Great to see your. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, let me just stop sharing and we can also stop. Um, maybe someone wants to ask questions outside of the recording. Okay, so I will stop recording.